Eska is a scientific term that is not often used. I tried asking friends and colleagues whether they have heard of Eska before, but they haven't. What's quite interesting is, the one friend that I've heard about Eska is not my zoologist friend. It's a Yu-Gi-Oh player. So, let me brought up the question. What exactly is Eska? So, what's with Yu-Gi-Oh player and Eska? Well, some Yu-Gi-Oh players like to know the lore or the reference of card design. If you look up the goatee archetype, you can find this table here, in Yugipedia. Here you can see the animal origin column, and for Kif, it is listed as Eska. But there is no animal called Eska. Just try googling Eska. You will most likely not find anything. The page here leads you to the anglerfish Wikipedia page. But again, there is no anglerfish called Eska. Let me just tell you straight. Eska is this thing. Specifically, the tip of the fishing rod, the glowing part in this image. This part, the rod itself, is called Elysium. Eska means bait, while Elysium means allure. It's self-explanatory, really. Oh, by the way, the plural form is SK and Elysia. For the Yu-Gi-Oh card, the little fish in the front of the Kif card is not a fish. It's just an Eska. The fish itself is back there lurking. Anyway, most people would probably think this lure is the most iconic diagnostic character of the anglerfish. That is, in a way, correct. Lure is a diagnostic character for the order, Lophiiformes, which is the anglerfish. But not all anglerfish is like what you imagine. The actual diagnostic character is a set of several Elysia on the head. That's it, not the Eska. Because not all anglerfishes have Eska. Now, you might easily believe that not all anglerfishes have Eska. But you might be confused. Wait a minute. What do you mean, several Elysia? Surely they only have one Elysium. At least the anglerfish that I know only have one. Right? Well, let's talk in more detail. The Elysium itself is a modified ray of the dorsal fin. So look at this skeletal image. These are the dorsal fins. Well, the rays of the dorsal fin to be precise. Now, let's take a look at their Elysium. Pretty similar structure, right? That's because they literally are. Like I said, it's a modified ray of the dorsal fin. Just way further in front. Looking at the skeleton here, it's obvious that there are more than one Elysium. In fact, most of angler fishes have more than one Elysium. So you might be wondering, why did the angler fishes in your memory only have one fishing rod? Or even, just while looking up angler fishes pictures, why did most of the images only have one fishing rod? That's because the other Elysia are usually either significantly smaller or hidden. Usually, the non-primary Elysium can be retracted or folded into the skin, so it's not visible. In some group of angler fishes, the non-primary Elysia are degenerated during metamorphosis, so basically adults only have one. By the way, Elysia have proper musculature so they could move it quite freely. Now, let's talk about the title of the video itself, the Eska. When you have learned about the definition of Eska, you might think about the glowing part of the fishing rod. Well, I did use it as an example myself. But, the Eska is not necessarily glowing. Eska is the modified tissues of the Elysium, and it varies. In some species, the Eska is indeed glowing. That's for the Keratioid, the deep sea angler fish. Sometimes, the Eska is just some filaments. Some even the combination of both. Sometimes the Eska is large, like this. Sometimes it's small, and even unnoticeable. Some look very simplistic, while others could look weird and complex. In some groups, these complex flaps can be used to conceal the glowing parts. Oh, and also, some don't have Eska at all, like I've said earlier. The non-glowing SK are just flaps of flesh and skins, basically. The glowing SK are a lot more complex, so let's talk about that in more detail. 
The glowing SK is still flesh and skin tissues, of course, but the structure itself is more complex. To explain this, I'm gonna use a very simplistic drawing. So, this is a simplified and generalized section of a glowing SK. The middle part is where the light came from. These are the light glands. Inside the light glands, bacteria can be found, which is the source of the light. I'll talk about these bacteria later. The center is basically a hollow part, called the central cavity. This entire middle section is enclosed by the reflector. The reflector layer consists of flat cells and crystals. These crystals reflect the lights, so the produced lights don't just disperse. You know, to make it concentrated and more powerful. There are muscle tissues among this layer, so they can adjust the light emission to some extent. On the outer side of the reflector is the pigmented layer, which contains pigments. The outermost part of the ESCA is epidermis layer. That's the gist of it, but there is some important detail. The ESCA is not a completely enclosed organ. There is an open canal. Underneath the epidermis layer is the vestibule. The vestibule is basically just an open space, connecting to the open canal. The vestibule also has canals growing towards the central cavity. So there are pathways connecting the interior to the exterior. And this is very important. As I've said though, this is a simplified and generalized illustration for the sake of this explanation. There are varieties to the ESCA anatomy among the angler fishes, such as different shapes, different positions, different sizes, etc. By the way, only the female deep sea angler fishes have ESCA. Why? Because the males are parasitic to the female and basically less developed. Some groups of deep sea angler fishes also don't have ESCA, like the Colophrin and Neoceratias. Now, SK are not the only glowing organs in angler fishes. I'll talk briefly about the other light organs, but before that, some angler fishes have caruncula, or simply called caruncle. Caruncles can be found in front of the dorsal fin. Caruncles are basically a side grade to the esca without the elysium. These also have bacteria. The other light organ in angler fishes is the hyoid barbels, especially in linophrin. These hyoid barbels don't have bacteria. They produce light with paracrystalline photogenic granules. Even on the larvae, you can already see the butt of their soon-to-be esca, or scientifically known as the primordia. In fact, you can usually see multiple of these in some groups. The anterior primordia usually become the primary esca, while the posterior either become the secondary, like in the double angler, or degenerated completely towards adulthood. Anyway, the esca itself is a branch ingrowth of epidermal cells from the primordia. As they metamorphose and grow, the elysium also elongate, forming the usual fishing rod that you're familiar with. In some groups, the ESCA of post-metamorphosed individuals can be quite big. Later, it will reduce in proportion towards complete adulthood. But wait a minute, what about the bacteria? Did they just spawn their own bacteria inside the ESCA somehow? Well, let's talk about it. When I was an undergraduate student, I've read about the topic of bacteria as the source of anglerfish bioluminescence, and I was so confused. I thought, how could the bacteria enter their body, and how can it be concentrated in the lure? At that time, I thought the ESCA was a closed structure, but it's not, as I've explained in the glowing ESCA section before. So that became clear to me, but I still had some questions. Where did they come from exactly? Are they just random bacteria available in the deep sea? Or are they specific bacteria that can only be found in, well, specific places. There was a publication on this in 2019. I've already graduated by then, so yeah. The case of this bacteria is quite peculiar actually. The bacteria found in anglerfishes SK have a significantly reduced genome. It's typical for organisms that become an obligate symbion of others. 
but there is a contradicting fact for this. You see, if the bacteria are transferred between generations, from parents to the offsprings, that would be the simplest and straightforward answer. That would make it intuitive. The bacteria just co-evolved with the anglerfish species. That's why it became obligate symbiont. But the thing is, these same bacteria can be found across different groups of anglerfishes. That means, the bacteria must be available in the environment. But if that's true, then the bacteria must not be an obligate symbiont. They must have evolved independently, not co-evolving with a specific anglerfish. Think of it like this. An entire species evolved to only be completely functional if it's picked up by another species, but they don't stick to said species. They just lay and hope they are lucky enough to be picked up. Isn't that kinda weird? There's also another evidence for this. The deep sea anglerfish larvae are not detected to have the bacteria symbiont. They only got their symbiont after they metamorphose into adulthood. Just so you know, the larvae live in shallow water. Well, relative to the adults, that is. After metamorphosing, they move to the deeper water. That indicates that they only pick up the bacteria symbionts after they reach deeper water. Which means, the bacteria symbionts themselves are somewhat free-living in deeper water. Unfortunately, we don't have a definite answer for this yet, because it's hard to observe them naturally. The function of esca is quite intuitive and well-known. It's to lure prey. The esca in the Antenaridae is famous to be very good mimic of worms and other small creatures. It's a type of aggressive mimicry, obviously to lure prey. The glowing SK also serves the same function. It could also be used to attract the males, you know, to initiate mating. Those ants are sound intuitive and very common. But have you ever thought, why would a prey be attracted to light? Well, that's because many deep sea animals are bioluminescent, so it's intuitive to mimic the prey of your prey as a bait, like how we fish. But you might be thinking next, why are they even bioluminescent in the first place? Wouldn't that just make them more visible to others? Some would probably answer, it's to counter shade themselves. Most bioluminescent creatures have their bioluminescent organ in their belly, so it's harder to see them from the bottom. But then you might ask, yeah, but how about when being seen from any other sites? But hold on a second, aren't most deep sea critters have reduced vision anyway? How effective and relevant is this bioluminescent exactly? Well, that's the problem. It's very difficult to do a thorough deep sea observation. We also couldn't simply bring them back to the surface because they'll die. Some survive indeed, but definitely cannot adapt to the environment and will probably die soon enough. We couldn't exactly simulate the condition of deep sea environment. Not yet at least. Which is why we don't have a definite answer to most of the questions regarding deep sea biology. But who knows? Maybe someday, you know, either we got lucky and simply observed some groundbreaking information, or perhaps we could someday simulate deep sea environment completely. Who knows? For now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, even though I've said it's very difficult to bring back deep sea creatures to the surface, there are indeed some deep sea creatures in some specialized aquarium like the Numazu Deep Sea Aquarium. Anyway, enjoy your day. <laughs>